Let's do it. Right on. Let's do it. Um, cool. Well, thanks everyone uh, for joining us. We're really excited to, to have you and we're really excited to have Charlie Smith, uh, the head of business development from Reserve Protocol joining us. Uh, before we get started, I really just wanted to again thank the Reserve community um, for all your guys' support and excitement around this event. The Chainlink community for all your support and excitement. Uh, we just celebrated one year on Mainnet. Definitely could not have done it without each and every single one of you. Really makes my day um, being able to work with everyone and, and see the excitement around everything that you guys are doing. Um, in addition, I really want to thank Charlie and Rory for helping put all this together behind the scenes over the past few weeks. Um, it's really exciting to see. Uh, so the goal of this Q&A is to allow the communities of both Reserve and Chainlink to learn more about the integration between Reserve and Chainlink. Um, explore kind of what's been happening uh, on Reserve side. They have a lot of new exciting announcements and things that they've been working on and to just to inform the community and educate a little more about the way that we both work together and maybe what some future plans might be. Uh, the q and is gonna last about 30 minutes, uh, give or take. Uh, and uh, afterwards, we'll be putting in the description any links that we talk about, uh, all the links to join Reserves communities, to join Chainlinks communities, um, and anything that will help you research uh, both of our uh, projects a, a little bit further. So um, to get started, uh, Charlie, how about you maybe just introduce yourself to everyone and give a little bit about your background, what your team is building and uh, what you're currently working on. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I'm Charlie, I head up business development for Reserve. So I cover everything from sort of stewarding the RSR community, um, handling all integrations and listings uh, that we do with other crypto companies. And, uh, and then I also do uh, some uh, kind of work on our go-to-market strategy. So that's like high level strategy and then also assessing new markets that might need, have a need for sovereign money and uh, permissionless payments. So that's kind of, so I wear a bunch of different hats. Um, and yeah, so in terms of what Reserve does, for those of you who aren't familiar, we're a decentralized stablecoin protocol, but we're doing quite a bit more than that. So you can think of it as a sort of end-to-end -end solution to bring crypto to emerging markets to markets that lack kind of reliable financial intermediaries. So we currently have an app that's live in Venezuela. It allows people to trade between RSV, our stable coin, and Bolivares. We brought that app to Colombia and we're bringing it to Argentina soon too. And there's several other markets that we're actively assessing. But the way it works is that we have a stable coin protocol that you can think of as a piece of open source software that sits on top of um, all the other kind of stable assets and other crypto assets that exist in the space. Um, and it means that when one of those is potentially shut down or if, uh, faces any issues with censorship in the future, we're able to rebalance that basket and uh, uh, keep the stable coin kind of consistent over time. So um, yeah, so we have the decentralized stable coin protocol. We have our app, which is powered by a sort of novel set of fiat on ramps. So you can kind of think of our app as something that has like, is aspiring to have the like user experience of something like Venmo while leveraging this sort of decentralized nature of a service like local bitcoins. Uh, so um, yeah, that's 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 more or less uh, that's more or less us. Right on. So is, is your app uh, available to download on the the iOS and uh, Android stores? Then yeah, so it's on uh, the Google Play Store right now. We have it region locked for now, but it's available in Colombia and Venezuela. Um, um, and most of our users there are Android users. There will be an iOS app in the future, but right now it's Android. Cool. So when you guys are like going to these new countries, do you see that people, do you, do you go into a new market by people requesting you or are you kind of identifying these, these markets that maybe have uh, instability within like their own financial markets and kind of just try to find people or how, how do you go about the, the go-to-market strategy? It's a, yeah, it's a great question. So I think it, it started off for us and I think this is how it is with crypto for a lot of people as this sort of like high level intellectual analysis where we are like looking at lots of different markets and thinking, you know, where is there significant volatility in like the local fiat currency? Where are there, you know, significant frictions on sending money abroad and receiving money abroad? Where is it that people opt out of the formal financial system in large numbers? You know, for example, looking at like, you know, quote unquote, unbanked people, but in many cases, people are choosing to be unbanked because the existing system isn't uh, meeting their needs. So that we'd look at like large kind of macro factors. 
and then drill in a little bit deeper and speaking with people and uh, in many cases, hiring people in the markets that we go to, uh, to get more familiar with it. But uh, so there is that sort of like Venezuela was on our radar from the beginning, for sure. And then, you know, when it comes to other markets, especially recently, um, given all of the sort of macroeconomic instability that we've seen, uh, we've been getting a ton of inbound interest. So there are like markets that we're having conversations now. And uh, it's because just there are people reaching out and just looking at the website and saying, you know, this isn't just the sort of like, you know, abstract utility for us. It's not like an intellectual debate, you know, of whether crypto makes sense or will be adopted. It's just very obvious that, you know, having a sovereign USD denominated account that enables international payments is really valuable if done right. Um, so we've been getting lots of inbound interest now, but it's been us selecting in the past. And so you kind of have like that chicken and egg problem. So if someone's requesting down and, and say you're in Venezuela and you have reserve, you download your app, do you onboard other businesses so that they can accept reserve protocol or is that kind of like the intermediary within the app or how, how does that work? Yeah, so it's something we do, we are working on is like merchant acceptance, but uh, you know, it's interesting. I think the merchant acceptance side of crypto has come a lot slower than people expected. And I don't think that's like an absolute barrier to mainstream adoption, but I do think it's like, and it's an enduringly tough problem to get lots of businesses to accept crypto. It's like really resource intensive and a lot of businesses don't want to do it because uh, it complicates their lives basically. But so the, the kind of main way we've gotten around that is, you know, is trying to be as liquid as possible with lots of exotic, like high volatility fiat currencies. So you can imagine like if, you know, for now at least crypto can serve as a sort of like safe or vault denominated in USD. And when you need to spend, you can really easily move into a local fiat currency. That's sort of like the, the dream for now. It's like an intermediary stage. And, uh, you know, in the long run, yeah, I think people are gonna wanna spend this directly and there are ways that we can do that. Uh, but for now, the priority is, you know, achieving really high levels of liquidity against local fiat currencies in tough to reach markets. Got it. Okay. Interesting. That, that, that's re really cool. Um, and so like, what has he seen as like the, the re adoption of reserve within this? Is there more liquidity, like the more that you go in or like, are they, so are they taking like their, their native currency and then how does, how does that exchange? Yeah. Work? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, uh, so we've definitely, we've been seeing steady growth, you know, to give people a sense of where we're at, you know, we're very much like taking seriously the process of achieving like really strong product market fit before we do like any sort of like major marketing blitz. Uh, but we've been, I think we've made really good progress on that front. So in Venezuela, we've been operating since something like in the, you know, mid fall of last year. And, you know, since then, uh, We've done something like over half a million dollars worth of uh, transaction volume without any marketing spend just to make sure that it works and the users are happy with it and that's been totally organic um and then uh yeah and then like you know we're doing you know we'll do like hundreds of transactions a day on on some busy days um and uh and we think that once we start marketing we'll be able to scale that up but to give you a sense of the flow and how that works so when you're if you're using a service like local bitcoin basically it's purely peer to peer, you're going to find a seller of Bitcoin, you're going to wire them money, and then you're going to uh, receive BTC on the other end or vice versa. And with reserve, we're kind of taking that model, but we are like creating an environment that's more user friendly, and then also more let relies less on the sort of reputation and trust uh, that uh, that you have to rely on with local Bitcoin. It's a pretty uncomfortable experience for most people outside of like hobbyists uh, using that service. And so we're trying to create something that is like local Bitcoin, but it's familiar. It's using a USD denominated currency. Um, and it's, uh, and it's, it's much more, you don't have to worry about like whether or not you have to can trust the counterparty on the other end. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, so it's, that's really cool. And I think, thanks for sharing that. Um, so South America is always like a, a high target. You see a lot of like high inflation within like those, those economies. Are there other ones throughout the world that you guys are also kind of identifying with some of these similar traits and that you might see as maybe like the next, next place that you're really looking to go once marketing and everything really, really kicks off? Yeah, yeah. So definitely Latin America is a really interesting case because it's like in many ways has really well-developed financial infrastructure. You know, a lot of people, have, a good number of people have bank accounts, not everyone, but they're there. There's like some burgeoning modern fintech apps uh, that can operate. It's higher friction than doing business in the U.S. or Europe, but it's not. It's it's doable. Uh, mm -hmm. But 
those institutions have become largely pretty politicized. And, uh, and so, you know, you'll go to Argentina and people have lived through the experience of not being able to withdraw money from their account, like in the early 2000s when El Corralito occurred uh, and people were unable to, to pull money out of their account. Uh, and they've lived through massive inflation due to kind of mismanagement uh, of the local fiat currency. So, so it's sort of an interesting one where it's a market that we feel like we can go to at this stage because there is enough infrastructure, but that infrastructure is pretty politicized and, 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 and functions worse than it should, giving, meaning that there's really a lot of room for crypto to do some good. Um, the other markets we're looking at definitely like there's some in the Middle East that are really interesting. I think like Turkey has had you know, prolonged currency volatility. And there is an in really interesting peer-to-peer -peer crypto market that's growing in those uh, in that over there right now. Um, and so, if you go to Istanbul, you can buy Bitcoin on the street pretty easily. Uh, and so, I think some of those, like Turkey, is really interesting. I think other markets in the Middle East are interesting that we're looking at. Nigeria also also is, is a one we've been looking at. Um, but we're going to be expanding more in Latin America. I think that's the top priority. Right on. Cool. Yeah, that, that's that's really exciting. Um, Maybe to kind of take a, a different turn at, at this. Um, I know that there's been a lot of like questions in that the whole stablecoin field in general is there, there's a lot of new stable coins that are coming. And so what makes reserve different and like what's gonna put, what's the advantage of someone in one of these lower economic countries using reserve based upon um, something else that, that might be out there in my future? Definitely, I think I saw one of the responses to one of your tweets, which was like, you know, like why in the world would someone use this in a sea of other stable coins? And I think that's like exactly the right question to ask. Um, and I actually would paint the picture maybe even a little grimmer that you don't have just like, it's not like there's a sea of like thriving stable coin projects. There's basically Tether. And then there's lots of people sort of biting at it, but generally not with a lot of efficacy. Uh, and so you have like USDC that has gotten some real traction by spending a lot of money and having the backing of some really reputable institutions. I think they've, they've you know, made a go at it, but like Tether is just overwhelmingly dominant and the sort of like meme of Tether being like, you know, defunct has really not held up too well uh, over time. Um, and I think the reason for that is that Tether, you know, developed a network effect within the exchange infrastructure and it's been really hard to dislodge that. And so when you think of reserve, I think we're going for a totally different market. So we don't, we're not like a direct Tether competitor. We, I mean, you know, one day, yes, maybe like we would, we would certainly love to like have some of that, uh, some market share in the, you know, exchange realm, but we're trying to do something that appeals to people who truly need crypto, like in a permissionless manner that need to use it like for savings and payments in the real world in emerging markets. And we think that's a much bigger market than the, uh, exchange market for crypto. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, so, so I guess the reason why someone would use us, it's partly that we think the stablecoin protocol, the way it's designed, will make it enduring and will make it last much longer than any of our like traditional custodian-backed stablecoin competitors. And then we also think that we're building liquidity and network effects in a totally new market. Like it's very much a blue ocean strategy where we're going places other people aren't willing to go, and we're building infrastructure that just doesn't exist yet. So. That's like the sort of like, you know, local Bitcoin like infrastructure that uh, that you just don't see too much of yet. Cool. Yeah. Th th thanks for that answer. Um, so wait, with that, um, how do you see are, are do you guys use oracles um, and like how, how do you kind of determine like the prices when you're using multiple different stable coins and kind of piling those together? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, the way our develop like our development timeline looks is we're kind of dealing in phases. So the it's like right now our main priority is growing the market cap of RSV through the adoption of our of our mobile app and uh, to that end we've been able to keep the stablecoin design pretty simple we have a bunch of additional functionality we're going to add that will require a price oracle feed but right now our stablecoin is a rigid index of USDC Paxos and True USD which we think is like very a very reliable stable structure for our end users. Uh, and allows us to focus development resources on building a really great mobile app experience. Um, but in the when we move on to the next phase, uh, which we expect to do kind of around the end of this year, um, we're going to add a bunch of functionality where uh, basically the collateral assets that back reserve um, will be able to be managed more dynamically. So rather than the stablecoin being a rigid index where it's redeemable for like one third USDC, one third true USD, uh, one third Paxos. 
it'll be that you can have like a more diverse basket of assets that maybe some of them have some volatility to them. And uh, that means that uh, this, the reserve vault manager has to be able to actively say, okay, how much are the collateral assets worth? And like, what does that mean? Like to what, to what extent is the reserve stable coin backed, you know, at any, uh, as those prices all fluctuate. Um, so yeah, so the, the Oracle informs, will inform the, uh, way the reserve vault manager changes the composition of uh, the vault assets and uh, sends out a message as to whether or not the vault is fully collateralized. Cool. And so I, I know I have this question. I think some others probably in the, in the communities do as well. Um, so you have reserve, which is RSV, and then you have reserve rights, which is the RSR, which is you kind of see um, people talking about. So what, what is the relationship and how does this work between reserve rights and then the, the reserve, which is the, the stable coin peg. What yeah, is yeah. Relationship? So, uh, so RSV is the product as far as we're concerned, you know, it's the stable asset that will power the, that powers the mobile app and uh, it's what we want to grow. RSR is essentially like having a stake in our network. So it's our governance token, our secondary token. And the way you can think of our business model is that it's a lot like PayPal where you know, PayPal makes money because it they bring as many assets under management as possible. They have users holding large balances in PayPal and they have users transacting and they're, you know, extracting a small fee on those transactions. And they're also, you know, potentially making money on the float as well uh, and just having uh, user funds under custody. With Reserve, you know, first, very conservatively, we're looking to generate revenue through a small transaction fee, uh, which we think we can do in the market that we're going to. Again, it's like a different market than the you know crypto exchange market, where if Tether had a fee, that would be like a serious you know a native fee that was significant. You'd be like, I don't want to use this. But if you have kind of a unique like a uh, network effect in some markets where there's not a lot of uh, you know where where you are by far the best option, uh, you can do that. You can charge a fee on uh, stablecoin usage. And then in the long run, you know we think like the, you'll have you have the vault if it has volatile assets in it, which you can get some yield on. That's another way of generating revenue. And then in addition, you know, if you have stable coins in the vault and there's DeFi lending protocols, can you, you know, generate yield by lending those out in a way that has virtually no counterparty risk? You know, that's also super interesting. So in the long run, you have all these different revenue streams. And essentially as uh, RSV grows and is used more, um, those funds are used to buy back and burn RSR, uh, shrinking its supply. Uh, and there's some kind of specifics as to the mechanisms of how, uh, how that occurs, but basically, um, the idea is as RSV generates more revenue, uh, the supply of RSR shrinks. So that's cool. the kind of, in short, that's it. And then in the future too, we'll uh, be doing some sort of decentralized governance where we'll suggest changes to the protocol, like changes to the composition of the assets that back RSV and uh, the token holders will be able to vote like yay or nay, do they want that to go through? So, yeah. Sweet. Um, and so like, where, where would you send someone if they're maybe just like getting into the space and wanting to learn more about reserve, uh, where, where's the best place to find good educational content um, from you guys? Yeah, so I would say definitely uh, check out the site. We have like, and no one really wants to read a white paper. So we have lots of short versions of everything. Like we have a short depiction of the protocol on the website. So that's www.reserve.org. Um, I'd hang out in the Telegram as well. We have team members there, uh, you know, several days a week. I'm there on Mondays usually. And then we have like our engineers come in other days and you can really like get under the hood and we're happy to talk with anyone about it. Uh, and then the Twitter, I think is like really good. I think that that's like a, you know, good way to stay up to date. The medium as well, solid. Cool, yeah, yeah. We'll drop those links for everyone um, after this gets done. Uh, after it gets published, we'll be able to drop those in there. Right. Uh, and so, so Reserve right now, it's, it's built on Ethereum, correct? Yes. There, is that the plan to stay there? Um, do you have plans to like, if there's other stable coins within like other blockchains or what's kind of your strategy around, around that? Yeah. So I think we're, we try to stay pretty pragmatic on this front. Um, today, when it comes to the core infrastructure, like management of the collateral backing for RSV and the, that smart contract infrastructure that really you can't, it needs to be like have a really robust consensus mechanism that, uh, you know, guarantees that it functions properly. Uh, there's just nothing, I, I think, that's on the level of Ethereum right now. Um, it may be that something else emerges, but for now, we feel pretty confident that that's the way to go and we haven't seen any other, you know, viable competitor. 
but um, we have, it's something we are open to and have looked at and had projects approach us about has been, you know, do we want to issue a version of RSV on another chain where say you lock up the ERC20 RSV uh, in, a, in a smart contract on Ethereum and then you issue uh, a corresponding amount on uh, another chain through like a two-way peg. That's, that's something we're, uh, we, we're open to. We haven't done it yet, but it's something, you know, it's not a development priority right now, but it's uh -huh. something we're open to. Uh, but I do think it's most likely that for, you know, scaling purposes, we'll end up using like an Ethereum, like if they're even still called like, like a side chain or something, yeah. something like that. Uh, but it could be that we do something else, but I, I really think it will be all Ethereum based. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of the engineering and taking, taking the steps of where, where you need to be and uh, where yeah. the priorities are. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, and so I know that, that the, the Chainlink community, we're big fans of Reserve. We we're one of the first, uh, we both announced with each other uh, about working with each other and integrating Chainlink oracles um, over a year ago. So, so, so it's been a while um, and, and a lot of collaboration between us. From your point of view, um, how's it been working with the Chainlink team and kind of where do you see this uh, progressing and where is it at, at today? Yeah, yeah, um, I think it's been great. Uh, you know, we were glad that we kind of were in touch with you guys and kind of knew of each other early on before the sort of uh, like Chainlink link wave, you know, came, came to be like what it is today, which is it's just awesome. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's been great working with you guys. I mean, your BD team and kind of like engineering support are extremely active in reaching out. And although it's not time for us to do the integration yet, uh, like they're constantly sending over resources and it is like, it's pretty high touch. Um, so I think like, you know, that that's been interesting because I don't think that I've you know, come in contact with too many other projects that are trying to cater to people doing what we're doing where there's just that level of follow through. Um, so, so that's been really good. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, uh, I think we feel like a strong sense of camaraderie with Chainlink and that like Sergey was thinking about some pretty, like what at the time were really obscure problems years ago, in, like 2014 or something. He's thinking about, you know, the Oracle problem when like Ethereum isn't really even a thing, uh, which is like pretty ahead of the game. And I think at least, you know, we like to think that we're also like really thesis driven project that's like had our take that it's gonna be like a decentralized stable coin for emerging markets and we've stuck to that. And we, uh, we think the world will catch up to us too um, in the way that it has for Chainlink. Cool. Yeah. Is, is that why you think that you see like so many like high profile backers on reserve is kind of just the thesis driven of your team? And uh, can you maybe just talk about that a, a little bit? Yeah, of course. So um, we have like a bunch of the investors from PayPal uh, who invested in our seed round and that so including Peter Thiel. And I think those guys are just like really thesis driven. Like that is how they operate. And, uh, you know, and that's how our team is too. It's like very much like explicitly, you know, um, being trying to be as explicit as possible about like these strategic assumptions we're making and then, you know, ensuring they're correct, testing them constantly and, uh, and, and sticking to it and, and being willing to do things that are like, you know, potentially seem kind of contrarian, like who starts a, you know, FinTech mobile app in Venezuela, you know, that's like a pretty out there move. Uh, yeah. But we think it's sort of like, you know, that's exactly where you're going to find out how to make crypto work in the conditions that it's always said it should work. And so it's like you build it there and it's like, you know, uh, and, and the idea is that it's battle hardened by, you know, being able to function in those markets. And then suddenly when crises crop up elsewhere, you know, reserve will be this like very clear and obvious solution that's been tested in some of the toughest environments. So, yeah, so I think it's basically it's like the thesis driven approach. I think those guys have it, the PayPal mafia guys, and I think we try our best to have it as well. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really exciting everything that you're working on, and it's big big problems um, and problems that, that need solved. So, always appreciate other teams that are that are really trying to solve real problems and um, put their head down and, and 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 actually put out code and, and work really hard. And that's yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. Cool. So, um, I think we're we're about at that time. Uh, is there anything else that that you would like to talk about? Uh, you have a few minutes. Um, you can. Anything else that you, that you want to add, or maybe that we didn't didn't touch on? Um, let's see. Uh, I don't think I have anything really to plug too much. Um, I think uh, I think basically, like I'll say this: um, that we really value kind of the constant interaction with our community, and we try to be really active in the Telegram. And like we've had so many times where people have come out of the woodwork and been like, you know, I live here and like this, you know, corner of the world and. 
uh, and we have this very specific problem with payments here. Um, and we love having those conversations. Uh, so, you know, definitely jump in the telegram at me. The admins are really active and passing questions along. Um, and uh, yeah, so that'd be great. So if you're like, if you live somewhere and you're like, there's this really insane specific payment problem that we're facing here, or like, I really think reserve could be useful here. Like that's the beginning of how we end up places sometimes or end up considering a market. So definitely do that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and if you have any like questions or, or like definitely skepticism towards what I'm saying also, like I very much encourage you to, uh, you know, air that, you know, throw it in our telegram. We're happy to talk about it. Cool. Right on. Um, yeah, we'll definitely, definitely show that those links again. And then um, I guess one, one last question, uh, what, what are you most excited for in the, in the next, next few months? I know it's been uh, crazy times right now, but, but where do you, what are you looking forward to and where do you see like things, things happen? Yeah, I'm really excited. Like, uh, you know, we have a UX revamp of the app coming out. And then in like, you know, I, I, I always get in trouble for saying dates, so I'm not going to say anything too specific. But, you know, I think around, you know, early fall, somewhere in there. Uh, that's when um, we're going to be doing like kind of our full fledged wallet experience where, you know, it's going to be sort of a new form of self custody that we think is super interesting and user friendly. And I'm just super excited to see, you know, the bets we're making on our user learnings translate into the app. And, uh, and I think people are going to start to see that pretty soon. And I'm, I'm excited because I'm hoping and, I, and I, we think that, you know, it's going to kind of come out of nowhere for people, which will be cool. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I mean, I'm excited doing the chain link integration too when that comes down the line. So yeah, that'll be good. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. But yeah, we're, so we're, we're pretty pumped. Right on, Charlie. Yeah, th this is really exciting. Um, that wraps up our video Q&A for today. Um, really want to thank you, Charlie, uh, and the Reserve team, the Reserve community, uh, as well as the Chainlink community for all you guys' support um, within this AMA itself, as well as um, just supporting both these projects, um, really trying to make a big difference within, within the world, which is very important right now. Um, and then all the other team members, Rory and um, Nevin and everyone else at that reserve that was able to make this possible and make this happen. Uh, we're looking to do a lot more of these in the future. Um, so make sure you subscribe to the channel um, and we'll be able to put all the content, all the links that we spoke about. Um, afterwards, we'll do a little bit of editing and then we'll be, then we'll be set. Um, but again, thanks, Charlie. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to next time. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Keenan. And uh, yeah, thanks to all the Marines out there for tuning in. Cool. Thanks, everyone. So, see ya.